Well, hi, everybody. I'm Phil Town. I'm Danielle Town. And we're going to talk about how to invest money and get your head on straight and be able to do it and go out there and make something better than, you know, 5% a year. Well, and maybe also feel good about other stuff going on in your life, too. I mean, I think investing is almost, from what I'm learning about it, it's almost like a crucible in which the rest of your life becomes... (laughs) <laughs> the issues in the rest of your life become more evident. And, and we get rid of the dross. We get rid of all of that nasty stuff that's messing you up in all aspects of your life just by focusing on making millions. Oh, well, that sounds amazing. Hey, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so and we actually, were talking last time about not losing money and how rule number one is don't lose money. Yeah, Warren Buffett said there's two rules of investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And uh, we immediately get eye rolls whenever we say that because it's like saying buy low, sell high. You know, it's it's uh, it's obvious. It's obvious, except no one does it. And Warren Buffett, of course, as we discussed last time, is this enormous anomaly um, who has been accused of being a monkey flipping coins in a random system and just lucky. And he went off to Columbia in 1988 and basically laid out this great argument that says he's anything but that that in fact it's skill and that there's lots of guys like him out there who have been trained by the same people. They're all who we call rule one investors. Buffett calls them the investors of Graham and Doddsville because David Dodd and and Buffett's mentor Ben Graham wrote the book on security investment called Security Analysis back in 1933 or 34. And that's been kind of the Bible of this kind of investing ever since that basically focuses on buying a $10 bill for five bucks and doing that over and over again over the course of your lifetime. So Warren Buffett says that the secret to doing that, the one rule you must follow, is to focus on not losing money. And that rule, that really is different than the way other people invest. Almost everyone, like all of your mutual fund guys, are all momentum investors. They're investing to make money. And to do that, they're gonna hope they buy something and it goes up. Well, isn't it obvious that you don't want to lose money and that you therefore want to buy something that goes up? I mean, those are the two options. I suppose there's three options. It goes down, it stays the same, or it goes up. And we want it to go up. Well, We don't want it to stay the same. Well, let me show you the difference. If you were to buy Yahoo in 1999, you were paying 11,000 times earnings. So it had a PE of 11,000. And... It had to go up in order to make any sense out of it, right? I mean, in other words, somebody, let me put it like this. Somebody else had to come along and pay more than you do, than you did, in order to make sense out of buying Yahoo at this enormously inflated price. And the downside, if nobody comes along to pay more, the downside's enormous on a stock that has an 11,000 PE. Um, let me give you another example. Like, you know, the whole real estate thing that happened is is based on a a huge bubble in real estate prices. And people were buying with an eye on the upside, not an eye on the downside. And so they were paying so much for a house that if you rented the house out, you couldn't even meet the mortgage payment. Wouldn't wouldn't happen. It sounds like you're talking about the irrational exuberance side of things. Yeah. So rather than feeling the fear that we've been talking a little bit about, it's the exact opposite. You're feeling overconfident. I think that's true that people do feel overconfident, but the vast majority of money that's invested, 85% of the stock market is managed by institutional fund managers. And the vast majority, I'm talking in the 99 percentile range of these fund managers, all invest in all markets with momentum strategy, trying to find something that's going to go up right now in the next month or two months or three months. When Warren Buffett is saying, look to the downside, watch out for losing money, that's the criteria you have to focus on, um, it creates a different approach to investing. Because if you're trying to make money in three months, you know you have to get it right. You have to get the momentum right, the stock is going to go up, and you have to. it all has to be right. If you're just trying to make money at some point in time, then you don't have to get the timing. The timing is not nearly so critical. And that allows you to focus more on the downside and just say, look, I know I'm going to make money someday, that this business will be worth more to tomorrow than it is today, and I'm getting it at a huge discount. And as a result of that, 
because of that discount, I'm also not worried about losing money on the stock. I'm, oh, so you're saying you're starting out with an assumption that you're going to make money. Oh, yeah, yeah. The assumption and is I'm going to make money. that's different than somebody who's trying to make money, who's looking at it in order to make money. That person starts with an assumption that they're not going to make money, and they're trying to figure out a way around that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It sounds to me like you're saying you start out with an assumption that you will make money because you've done the research, you've done, you've followed the principles that we just talked about that Charlie meant, that Charlie uh, discussed in his little one minute thing that we've been playing. You, you know, you, I already miss it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, we love you. Um, you know, you, you, so I don't know, I'm extrapolating here. It sounds to me like you're saying that you start out with that assumption, having already done that research and having that confidence that you're not, or that you will make money. And then your next step is to see how you could maybe lose money and then hedge against that. Am I on the right track here? Yeah, I think you're on the right track. It's actually kind of an interesting formulation of what we do because um, in fact, when we go through the process that Charlie's talking about, where you understand the business, you know, that, that you um, have a big moat business, that the management's a good team, in, in effect, you have a wonderful company. And then you, because it's a wonderful company, you, and that means to a certain degree, it's quite predictable of what, what's going to happen in the future. And because of that, you can figure out the value of the business. So when you figure the value out, then you see, well, what's the price? In fact, we go through this whole process of figuring all this stuff out before we even look at the price. I don't even want to know what the price is. Right, which is something we talked about initially because I thought that seemed really dumb. The, like that the price is the most important barrier and then you figure out if the company is okay that was my initial thought about the whole thing about yeah your, about your a research style but um well it, it tends to influence you in a negative way um when you know that you think this is on sale or that you think this is on sale already and you sort of are starting to extrapolate back and hope it's a wonderful business it's it's a little bit safer to come at it uh, the, the front way around, like Charlie is saying, and make sure you understand, make sure you got a moat, make sure you got a good management team, and then figure out the value of the business. And now go look and see what is it selling for. Oh my gosh, it's on sale. That's or, ideal. Probably 95% of the time, oh my gosh, it's not on sale. Yeah, yeah, right? for sure. 95% of the time, oh my gosh, it's not on sale. So you're, you're looking for very specific things. And, and granted, what we do to look for stuff that's going to be on sale is we're looking at stuff that has an event happening. Something's happened. Like I, I was just listening to Warren talk about um, missing out on buying healthcare stocks when Bill Clinton came in as the president and he and Hillary were trying to put in a nationalized healthcare system back in 19, whatever that was. And, um, and man, all the healthcare stocks just crashed because they were about to be nationalized, you know? And, and so this emotion came into the market and Buffett was like, I, you know, I sat there and sucked my thumb looking right at this event that was creating massive discounts to value on these companies. And I just didn't do anything. So it's a giant mistake. He said, most of my mistakes I make is I don't do something. So, well, he didn't know that that wasn't going to go through either. I'm, I mean, I don't know. I can't read his mind, but he basically said that was a big, dumb mistake. Mm -hmm. I should have bought those stocks right then. Right. And so, um, we're, we're pretty much always starting off with an event. Something has happened that in this industry, which has made it an obvious place to look for gold, to look for something on sale. And so, so then it does that, make like, sense. So that's where that macro business market research comes in that we started out talking about. Um, Is that right? Well, not so much, actually, I don't think. I mean... Well, how do you know about events happening in industries? Oh, you just see it in the newspaper? That's what I'm talking about. Research. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you just read the newspaper. Like, I'm not looking specifically at Google. I'm reading the newspaper yeah. and saying what's happening in the world. Yeah, and you say, oh, they're nationalizing the healthcare system. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fairly important news. And and most of these events are not just, you know, momentary. Oh, my gosh, I missed the paper yesterday, and I missed this huge opportunity. It's not going to be like that. These things are going to be in the news for some period of time, Um you know, many of the investors that do what I do don't really pay any attention to things when the market's open at all. You know, they're sort of playing golf. 
and it's really not fast paced. We're, we're looking at something that the average person could absolutely do in terms of the time involvement here. So, um, so I want to kind of give you guys confidence that this is not a huge time sink. I mean, M Manesh Prabhide is running a billion dollar fund and, and he laughs that his wife just doesn't even think he has a job. I mean, he, he gets up at 10 in the morning in Newport Beach. The markets are, have been open since nine on the East Coast. He's been asleep. You know, it's just not that sort of day trading. Oh, I got to make a move today. You know, none of that is, is what we do. I don't totally buy that. I think you once you own a stock, you have to be following it every day. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, my gosh. Things no. can happen. Oh, no, no, Very no, no. quickly. Yeah, but we those... talked about BP a while ago. You wanted to know about that oil spill on the day it happened, right? Yeah, okay, that is You don't want to know about it a week later. That's something you'd want to be paying attention to. Although really a week later is when it really started affecting the price. It didn't affect it on the first couple of days. So maybe it was even more important to know about it on the first day. <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> but, but in, in general. Yeah, you don't need it when the market opens. Maybe you just check every day. Yeah, you just sort of look in, in, at the news. And, and if you've got five companies, it's not that hard to figure out, you know, oh, this piece of news is affecting BP. It's BP's well. Right. Or, you know, BP's in the Gulf. So um, we don't try to make a big deal out of it. The whole macro world thing and trying to figure out where the world's going to go and whether we're going to be in a depression or a recession or an inflation or whatever. Um, I heard Warren be real specific about this. He says, we have never, ever bought a stock and we will never, ever buy or sell a stock uh, on the basis of some sort of macro, you know, world view that we have. Isn't says, that exactly opposite of what you just said? No. That it's, he, it's he, said, he said, like, if you got, like, he said, if you've got, like, the Secretary of the Treasury in one ear and the head of the Federal Reserve in the other telling you exactly what they're going to do for the next six months, he said it wouldn't affect a single decision he makes. <laughs> You're going, like, I roll. Yeah, because you just spent 10 minutes talking about events and how you have to pay attention to them and how they can make the price go down or up. Oh, yeah, but events are not. All right, let's make sure we're using the terms right. When I'm talking about macro, I mean, like, there are lots of investors like, say, Ray Dalio, um, Julian Robertson did this as well, really good Rule 1 style investors who are very interested in macro. They're always looking at what's going on in the world, like not specifically to this company, but, you know, world events. What's Russia doing? What's South America doing? What's China doing? Right. All this stuff. Um, and Buffett is basically saying that's not critical to our investing strategy at all. All we're looking for is do we understand the business? Has it got the intrinsic characteristics we're looking for? And is it on sale? Well, that's really cool that you're saying there's two different and probably multiple different ways to look at long term investing. Maybe depending on your own personality and how you are interested in the world and interested in news. If, I mean, a lot of people are news junkies and love reading that stuff sure. and are constantly up just for fun. You know, they have nothing to do with investing. They just like reading the news and knowing what's happening in the world. That might be somebody who focuses more on a macro perspective. It might be, and uh, but I would urge you to think about how much time that can take and how smart you have to be. But the point is, to, people are already figure that doing out. it. It doesn't okay. matter how much time it's going to take because it's already time that you're putting into your day that that you just like to it, do. It counts as your free time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, fair enough. If you're into that, but I would say that you know, my view is anyway that you you're making something that's really pretty easy and simple into something that's actually really hard and difficult by shifting decisions over to the macro, because it's really hard to know where the world's going. It's really hard to know. I mean, man, alive. Um, who knows how the world's going to react when, when Yellen raises interest rates, if she ever does? Who knows? Nobody knows what's going to happen. We could crash into recession. It could be considered a non-event. I mean, who knows? And I mean, to, to, to know how important it is to understand that this is very difficult, consider that if you knew those kinds of things, all you'd have to do is trade the bond market, which responds aggressively to that kind of data, and you'd make a fortune. You know, well, if you know what what's going to happen if Janet Yellen raises rates, then, hey, you know, you should know what to do with a 30 year bond right now. Isn't there a difference between making projections based on guesses, based on informed guesses, maybe about what's going to happen with interest rates and responding to a major world event that has already happened? 
That's well, what I would call an event. Maybe you should tell me what you define an event as. Well, I'm defining an event as something that is going to essentially create an, an enormous amount of fear around companies that I'm interested in. So it's specific to a company? Yeah, ultimately it has to come down to the company. Ultimately, the fear has to be expressed by the stock price falling off dramatically in a company. Or it could also just be that the stock won't rise because of growing fear over time. Like that's what's happening right now with an IBM and with a with an Oracle, um, is that with, a, with a Gilead. You know, the, these companies, the stock price isn't rising because of the fear that they're not going to be able to make this transition into this new world. Um, with BP and Transocean and Halliburton, you know, the prices of those stocks dropped like a brick because of why a well had broken and they couldn't stop it uh, from leaking into the Gulf and they were going to be sued by everybody. So um, the, what I'm really most interested in is when there's a growing fear in a group of companies that I can understand. Mm -hmm. That's what triggers my, my desire to go and start digging. Um, Charlie Munger style, right? Do I understand it now? Okay, does this company have great, uh, great intrinsic characteristics, and do I like the managers of the thing? And I want to ask, you know, does this fit my value set? Do I like what these guys are doing in the world? And if all of that's good, then I'm going to be really looking at that thing to go on sale, and I want to buy it when it goes on sale. Um, and that's, I don't know if that really explains why the focal point of our investing is on not losing money. Uh, very well. It kind of tells you how we go about looking at figuring out whether we should be looking into that stock or not. But and we're looking at this concept that we're we're trying to focus mostly on not losing money. It's it's um, it's a mindset, I think, if you will. In other words, let me let me tell you it like this: If you wanted to buy gasoline for your car for the next 10, 15 years, do you want the price of gasoline to go up or down? You're, I'm not. I'm not you're, following. Okay, the you're going to go to the. It's not hard. This is a you simple want me to question. You buy all the gas all at once. No, right now? no, no, not at all. Oh, I want you to, to oh, well, just then I tell want me. It to go down. So you're going to be consuming gasoline. I thought you meant I was going to buy all the gas. No, no, okay. no, no. You're a gas consumer. Okay. Gasoline consumer, and and same thing with buying you know veggie burgers at Whole Foods or whatever, right? If we're consuming it. We want the prices of those things we're consuming to go down in the future because it makes it cheaper for us to buy them. So let me ask you this then. If you understand that about gas and veggie burgers, <laughs> <laughs> what about stocks? So if you buy a stock today, do you want it to go up or down? I want it to go up because I'm not consuming it. I'm going to resell it to somebody else. When? That's a good question. I don't know when. I mean, ideally... Whenever I think it's about to go down. Okay, then we're starting to get into kind of dangerous territory, I think, a little bit. Because you're guessing. Yeah, because we guessing. don't really know. There's no crystal ball on this kind of stuff. And so, let's say we just had the ideal situation. We can buy a company today, and we are going to receive cash flow on that company for the rest of our lives. It pays a dividend, and it buys back its stock, and... Within a matter of four or five years, we're getting 20% a year on distributed cash and within on our basis. And within, I mean, right now, Warren Buffett owes, owns C's Candy, for example. He paid $25 million for the company. And it, today, it puts out $60 million every year in pre tax cash flow. So I mean, that's good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Every year, you're getting over two times what you paid for that business. So there's no reason to sell that. No business. reason to sell it. So we would have like businesses that will do that for us, right? And so if you were to buy this business, um, again, let me ask, do you really want the price to go up in the future or down? If, if you never intend to sell it. If I never intend to sell it, then I don't care. Well, you might because you might have more money to invest in the future. You're a lawyer. You're going to make money. You're going to save money you're going to find a time in the future where you have more money to invest. So wouldn't it make your life easier? Is this a company that's throwing off a dividend? Yeah. Dividend, so I, oh, so buybacks. I am getting some money. Okay. Yeah. I'm confused about why I'm constantly buying a stock I never intend to sell and will never get any money from. Yeah. Okay. You're going to look at this just like someone who owns the whole business. 
That's, that's how I want you to see it. I don't want you to look at it from the point of view of a stock investor. We don't look at businesses like stock investors. Stock investors look at businesses like, I'm going to buy it now and I'm going to sell it later and make money. What we look at it as an owner of a business, we're going to come in and buy this now. We're never going to sell it. And we are going to live off of the cash flow coming off of this business. So in that case, it's just like, let's say you and I both owned a restaurant together and I decided I need to sell my half of it. And we had it appraised for a million dollars just three months ago. So I come into you and I say, look, Danielle, I really need you to buy this from me. Um, I need the money pretty bad. So we know it's worth 500,000, my half of this. I want to sell you a half of my half. I'll sell you a quarter of the business, which has been appraised at 250,000. I'll sell you that for $100,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you let's say I you buy it for 100,000. All right. And then I come back in 3 months later and I say, "Look, I I got to get out of this. I'm desperate for some capital. And I know you're really tight to get any money, but I will sell you the other last 25% of this restaurant for $50,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. The price went down. But are, aren't you happy that the price went down if you're buying the last piece of this for less than you bought the previous piece? Yeah, because it's making money. Yeah. So why wouldn't a stock investor think the same way? Why would I want to, if I own a piece of IBM, and I've got more money in the future coming in from other things that I do, why wouldn't I want to buy IBM at a cheaper and cheaper price if I really love the business and it's thrown off a pile of cash flow? I mean, that makes complete sense if you're getting money from it. Yeah, and IBM is pouring out of money. Man, they're just pouring money. Like they're putting money out in the form of buybacks of $8 a share, and they're doing about $4 a share in, in uh, dividends on a company you can buy today for 160 bucks. So think about it for a second. If they're paying out $12 a share in one form or another, and they're going to continue to do that into their future, which is something they've been doing. They've been doing it since the middle 1990s. Let's say just without arguing the, whether it's true or not, let's just say IBM was going to increase the amount of money it was paying out every year by 10%, and it was going to throw out that money um, to you in the form of dividends and buybacks why wouldn't you want the price to go down? Because if they were buying back their stock every year, they're getting more and more of it for cheaper and cheaper prices. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Well, that's exactly what Warren Buffett said when he bought IBM. He said, I hope these guys' price just goes down because they're buying back all this stock and it's making me a higher percentage owner of the company every single year. And so think about this. As rule one investors... It's like you've taken the blue pill in the Matrix. You know? You remember that? Where, where like, the guys offered, Keanu Reeves offered the red pill where you can stay in the illusory world and keep, and just believe that it's all true. Or he can take the blue pill and see it the way it really is. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yes. Okay. So this is blue pill, and maybe we should name it that. Blue pill investing. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of names for this style of invest We're value investing, blue pill values investing, investing <laughs> conscious <laughs> investing. What else have we come rule oh one? Investing. God, enlightened in so we <laughs> this is blue pill investing. We are taking a reality pill, and the reality pill lets us see finally that when we buy a wonderful company, we're buying it on sale. We don't want it to go up. We want it to go down. Am I right in saying, but only if there's a dividend? Well, yes and no. Think about this. If the company was just buying back its stock and the price went down, for every dollar it was spending on the stock, it was getting more shares than if the price was up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great for us, right? Because here's the thing. We know that we value this business as 10 bucks, and we're paying 5 Okay, we know that going in. So we know someday Mr. Market is going to weigh this business correctly. He's going to price it at 10 bucks. This is real important. And I think that's the key, is that at some point the price will reflect your opinion of the value. Yes, at some point it will. Which means the price will 
go up. Right. So we actually do, at some point, want the price to go up. Only when we're ready to cash it out. Okay. Right? But, and in reality, I'll tell you what actually happens. Okay, what actually happens is Mr. Market realizes his mistake pretty quickly and then turns around and puts those prices back up where they were. And so these events that happen create a lot of emotion. And if you can separate those things where the emotion is, is, is all about something that's really just a short-term problem from those things where it's a disaster, for real, if you can separate those two, you're going to make an enormous amount of money. That's essentially what all of us do, is we just look at these things and separate the wheat from the chaff. And so um, we know that someday this is going to go back to its real price, but dang, or its real value, but darn, it sure is nice if it would stay low long enough to keep putting more money into it or even go lower than we originally bought it. So if you'll think about it, that we're buying $10 bills and we're paying $5, and then in a year we can pay $3 for the same $10 bill, we should be really excited about that, not depressed that our $5 investment has gone to 3 Yeah, because we're confident that it's going to go to its real value at some point. At some point, we know it will because we know the market in the long term is quite accurate. Is that when we sell it then, when it goes up to what we've decided the value is? Well, that's when you get to make the fun decisions, all right? And these are fun decisions. Because you, you started out asking when I would sell. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the answer. Exactly. Okay. Well, it kind of depends on whether you're... How, it, it depends on the company. So, for example, if you own the entire company that you bought for $25 million and now it's throwing off $60 million a year, you could sell that to somebody um, for a price that would reflect that $60 million cash flow that's coming in. You know, maybe you could get, you know, $600 million for it and use the money and do something else. So the, the, the answer to the question is going to be, how will you reinvest this great cash flow? So if you remember, we went back to that story that we made about the river touring company that had a million dollars a year coming off of it and you were 75 years old and you're going to have to decide if you want to sell it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're 55 years old, it might be a real different decision. Mm -hmm. You know, you might not have a place to reinvest that million um, and you want to reinvest it because you're still cranking away, you know? Do the future plans of the company come into that decision? Oh, sure. It, it always depends on, you always evaluate the value of the business based on what it's really doing, where it's at right now and where, it's, where you think it's gonna go. But if it's a wonderful business and you can buy it and the thing reduces your basis, think about where you end up. Um, it's quite likely to people who are buying IBM right now that it's producing this $12 per share uh, cash flow. If it continues to do that, let's say for, um, let's say for five years and it grows it at 10% a year just for fun, um, if it didn't grow it at all, you'd have 60 bucks back in your pocket, but it grew it at 10% a year. So I don't know, what do you got back? 80, let's say, $80 back in your pocket in the form of buybacks and dividends. You collected that back. Well, you only paid 160 for the company. So now you've returned to yourself $80 of capital. What's your risk in the company? 80 bucks. 80 bucks. That's what you still have on the table. But IBM at this point is throwing off, let's say, a $15, $16 a year cash flow buyback program on your $80. So pretty soon your basis is down to zero. Or you start living on it. Let's say you arrive at that 70-year-old place and you say, okay, I'm no longer going to reinvest this somewhere else. I'm taking this $16 this year and I'm going to live on it because I have, let's say, uh, 5,000 shares. So this $16 represents about $80,000 of income to me. All right, so this year I get $80,000 from IBM and I'm gonna spend it and live on it. So my basis is no longer going down. I'm now spending this stuff. So my basis in IBM is 80 and it's producing a 20% return to me in the form of cash. And, um, and then next year it grows it a little bit more. And so next year I get $17 or about 22%. And the year after that, I might get 23 or 24% and 18 bucks. And this is going to grow the rest of my life. 
it's it's a wonderful thing. This is what we call an equity, or Warren calls it an equity bond, which I think mm -hmm. is a great name. Mm -hmm. It's essentially a bond that you just keep the rest of your life, and what it does is pay you this cash flow forever and continues to grow forever. And you end up ultimately in this kind of situation that Buffett's in a little bit, where you paid 25 million for something or $25 for something and it's throwing off $60 a year for the rest of your life. That's a phenomenal position to be in as a retired person. As you go through an analysis like that, how does the reminder of don't lose money play into that for you psychologically? Well, it becomes the focal point of the decision process. So when we go through the decision process, we use this sort of, um, I don't know, an acronym because we, we consider ourselves rule one investors. So we kind of like think of ourselves as rulers. Okay. They, I don't know. It happened on the blog. It's just fun. And and so now we tell everybody who does this kind of stuff calls himself a ruler. All right. Well, rulers was a really good little acronym. We start off with being rational and, and or, or radar is the R. Oh, rulers became an acronym yeah, as well? Yeah, it did. It's a total acronym. <laughs> and so we, we, like the R is for radar. How do you find this thing? You know, like, and we'll talk about that more. We've got some great radar ideas for you. Then the next uh, letter is U, understand, right? Like Charlie, understand the business. That's meaning, moat, management, margin of safety. Um, the L is make sure it matches your values. Love it. The E is what's the event that created this thing on sale? And we really are strong about that. We just really don't believe that we are that much smarter than Mr. Market. If there's no event, we're probably not on sale, even if we think it is. So we do dig deeper until we understand it better. So E is the event that put it on sale. And then R is to reduce basis with dividends, buybacks. And we even do some options to, to help reduce the dividends or reduce the uh, basis in the stock so that we can get a high return cash on basis and the S is the key. And that is you create a story around this company. Do you understand it? What's the event? Do you love it? How are you gonna reduce basis? You create this story around the company and then you invert the story. And this is Charlie Munger's major, major thing is he just said, somebody said, how do you make sure you're not gonna make a mistake? Invert, always invert is what Charlie said. And what, what does inverting mean? It means you turn it on its head. It means that you take a look at this from the point of view of someone that says this is a bad investment and here's why. So let's say with an example for is IBM is Buffett thinks it's a great example because it's a gigantic brand moat company that has always made the turn and always will make the turn and it's going to make the turn into the cloud and it's going to be successful. They don't have to be first. They can be last every time, but they're just so in they're just they have what's known as a switching moat. They're so deep into your company you can't get rid of them even if they're not the best, right? And that keeps, then when they become the best, they leapfrog everybody and then you're good for another 30 years. So that's IBM's moat. And so the story is IBM's got this gigantic intrinsic characteristic that protects it against other companies. And they're run by really, really smart, really, really good people. Um, and they're worth a lot more than they're selling for today because everybody's worried about the event, which is the cloud. All right, so that's the story in a nutshell. Now, invert the story. And the inversion to the story is what Charlie is saying you really have to do. And you don't do that unless your attention is on not losing money. If, if you're all about momentum, you've got a good story. The stock is looking like it's creeping up. Put your money in there and ride that stock. But if you're really focused on not making a mistake, and that's where you really put your attention, then this step is the next critical step and it has to be done. And that is you invert the story and make up another story. And the story you make up is why this is a terrible idea to invest in IBM. Yeah, so you argue both sides. Yeah, so you become a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to make a rebuttal. So in effect, it's like the scientific method for investing, right? You, you, you have a hypothesis, now you try to prove you're wrong. Yeah, I mean, I like that idea. It's very easy when you're attached to something to not really give a great argument on the other side. It's it's really actually really difficult to um, to honestly, be truthfully, objectively, intellectually honest about the problems 
with your first argument. Right. It's really difficult, just just emotionally, because right. you're attached to the first one. Right. You probably spent the last two weeks researching this company and getting more and more excited about it, and then you found out that it was on sale, and you got really excited about it, and then you thought, oh, right, I've got to invert the story, and oh, I just it's really difficult because everything's so great about it. I mean, I can completely see that um, that sort of uh, line of thought. And you feel like you inverted the story, but maybe you didn't really. Is that somewhere where having like an investing partner would be really helpful? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is Warren Buffett has Charlie Munger. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. I mean, the, the, the Tiger Funds started this idea of story with Julian Robertson um, because that, caused, that, that required that you put your story up in front of a peer group of other managers who would then just eviscerate it if they well, possibly could. And that is classic scientific method. You write your <laughs> experiment in a journal and explain <laughs> it as best you possibly can, which as many sources as you possibly can, and then people just rip it apart and it's the worst. <laughs> and hopefully you make it through that and people can replicate your experiment and your results. Yep. So actually in the hedge fund industry, there's a, there are conferences that go on at various times in the world. and. And what happens at these conferences is a, a fund manager will come up, you know, someone who has the respect of their peers, they'll come up and they'll make a 10-minute presentation. And that presentation always features the downside. And usually oh, they're making do, a presentation about hey, some what, prediction Here's my they story. Have. Yeah. This is the company in Canada, and here's all why you should do it, uh-huh. and um, where, it's, where we think it's going to go. And here is the bear case. They can call it the bear case, right? right. Here's the bear case. Here's the, the naysayers are saying this about it, and this is why they're wrong. So one way to get yourself to some level of objectivity about this thing um, is to, first off, really understand the business that you're in so you can see the finer points. And then second, take a look at websites that, where they have a lot of people writing commentary about a company. And there are going to be some guys on there who are short that company, and they're going to put out the short case, the, the case that says this baby's going down like a brick. And they're going to present it as aggressively as they can to convince you that you should also short this company. Um, and that means that that information, that the sort of hyper-objective negative view of this is out there on the Internet. What websites are those? My favorite one to use is a website called Seeking Alpha. Dot com. It's a free website. I think there, last time I checked, there's about 750,000 serious investors on it. It's very much oriented toward uh, this style of investing. So you have a lot of people writing about value investing type things. Not necessarily the way we do it, but certainly in the, air, in the ballpark of looking for good deals and things that are on sale and waiting patiently to do that. Um, not having massively diversified portfolios with hundreds of stocks in them. You know, really focused. And um, there are thousands of writers. I think there's 3,500 writers who are on that site. And so, as if you're a beginner investor, that's a great place to go. I mean, you, you find a company that's in your three circles, think you like it. Um, go over and put the name of that company into the Seeking Alpha. All you got to do is sign up and it's no charge. Put it into the little bar, name of the company, the symbol will come up, click on it, and um, you will see all of this commentary. Like it goes back for years. Um, and you can read the transcripts from the annual reports and all that. It's all right there. A very, very good website to be on um, to dig into this stuff. And that's where you get your, your, your bear case. And then now you have to be sure you rebut that. And also what's fun is that a lot of rebuttals are right there on the website as well. So you can kind of, you know, grab information from a lot of good, thoughtful writers and, um, and help grow your uh, expertise in that industry. As a beginner to investing, that sounds a bit daunting. Um, Having to decide which side is correct with good arguments on both sides, I'm assuming. Well, you can, you can, yeah, I mean, obviously, if people are going to short a company, they think they've got a good argument. Exactly. Right? They think they do. So what would be daunting is to try to decide which one's right if you don't know anything about the industry or the company itself. No, of course. Saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that we've done our research. 
we we've obviously already decided that we think that the moat is good and the management is good and we think that we understand the company. Okay. So you've done some work. You've done some work. Which means you've read the 10Ks back four or five years. The 10Ks are the annual reports. So you've read those for five years back. Um, you have looked at the competitors. You think that this is absolutely the best company in, in the market and in that industry. Um, you feel confident that you can make a projection about what the value is. And you've come to realize, if I'm right about my value, this is a $10 bill on sale for $5. Let's mm-hmm. say you're at that point. Mm-hmm. Now, you begin to read the commentary from people who are running hedge funds or they're, they're analysts at hedge funds. Now you're reading professional commentary, right? Exactly. And, and they're saying something different. And they're saying something different. And now, if you are swayed by what they're saying, then keep digging because you don't know as much about this as you thought you did. That's all that does. In other words, it's like a scientist who gets an anomaly thrown at them about, you know, they like, the world is round, and then somebody keeps coming up with this, yeah, but, you know, I'm going up a hill. So, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a horizon. What there's a horizon. Mean? So you, you, you have to be able to deal with, with the negative stuff, because here's why. If you're serious that you're following this kind of path, then when you buy a company, you do want its price to go down after you buy it. In fact, we enter a company, when we start buying, almost always we end up buying a a little bit and then a little more and then a little more over time. So we really do want the price to go down from the place where we started entering it. And if it's going down aggressively and you're not dead sure of your answers to those short seller questions, you're gonna start getting scared that you missed something. Oh, absolutely. Yep. You're that's scared where... before you even buy it. <laughs> so it's a real litmus test. I mean, that, and, and honestly, um, you get to find out really quickly that you didn't know what you thought you knew. Your emotions will tell you that. And then you have to back the heck out of there and, and to regroup and realize, wow, I, I really needed to read a little more about this industry. I really needed to understand it better because I got scared um, when that price was going down. And that's that's going to happen to you. And so you really need to do the homework. When when uh, we were going into Burlington Northern, we knew Buffett was buying it, and we knew he was buying it at anything below 80. And we started buying it at 65, and it went down to 50. And so if we didn't really understand why we were buying this, why Warren Buffett was buying it, it'd be pretty scary to have it go down by almost 30% in a matter of two or three months. You'd start to think like, wow, maybe these guys know more than I do. You know, maybe they're smarter than I am. Oh, oh, they are smarter than I am. Ooh, maybe they went to better schools than I did. Oh, gosh, they did go to better schools than I did. So you have to know that the reason that they're selling makes sense to them, but they're wrong on the long term. It would make sense to them to do it short term. If you're a short term investor, which they all are, if it makes sense to do it on the short term, it is possible it would not make sense to do it on a long term, and it's a great investment. People have different motivations for doing things. Massively different motivations, massively different time horizons, and that leads us to be able to believe that it's possible for us to invest and buy something that really smart people are selling, and we understand the reason they're selling it, but we have a different horizon for our purchase, and so we can buy it um, with a longer term view. Don't lose money. Don't lose money. It's real focus. And I'm not sure we really got all the way into this. I, I think no, we're going we to touch on, on this getting, again. We keep on getting off on other let's, things. Let's drive harder on this on the next one. I think I think there's more to dig out of this idea that you don't lose money as a focal point. And I want to talk about Monash Pabrai, who is one of the most brilliant, brilliant investors on the planet and, um, and who absolutely focuses like this. And I want to tell you about it the way he looks at it. And... Um, and we can dive into a little bit of the Patel story, which is phenomenal. And it's all about very, very controlled downside, very big potential upside that has resulted in the Patel family coming to own 40% of the hotels in America in just 40 years. A stunning story. So let's, okay. Manesh tells this story in his book, Dondo Investor. Go get the book and read it. It's fabulous. So let's dive into that. And maybe that'll help us understand how looking at... Um, at the downside is the key to Sounds great good. investing. Okay, good. All right. All right. Well, until now, next time, I guess, time to go play. All right, bye. Here we go. See you. 
Thanks for listening to Invested, the Rule One podcast. If you like us, please subscribe and leave a review for us on iTunes. You can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and get more information about how to invest on your own by going to ruleonepodcast.com. Everything we've discussed in this podcast is either Danielle's opinion or my opinion and is not to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.